one of the series that Peter has worked on, and the toys are actually from his father's collection that he had collected throughout his life. And um, he really started the series sort of looking at it in a way to make statements about politics and, and toys and the way that toys are put into children's hands and it can have so much um, power. Yeah. And that so many of the toys are others. They're not necessarily Americans uh, that you're sort of at a very young age programmed to dislike, distrust, and try to kill someone who's from another country. Oh. So <laughs> this particular figure is from a military band. So even though it looks prosaic, <laughs> he's still part of the military um, you know, program. Okay? Uh, the dogs, interestingly enough, this guy, it, there's, there's maybe about five manufacturers that are well known for little lead toy soldiers or toys. Um, these are made by a company called Britons. And usually they have, if you turn it over, they have, you know, they're on the bottom that it says Britons. Britons apparently had done military things for years and years and years. At a certain point, they were getting outcry from the public saying, you're only making war toys. So Britons, to sort of do a PR <laughs> rebirth, started doing series that were farm animals, uh, circus animals and series, clowns, things like that. And so the dogs are actually part of their sort of <laughs> trying to make their image better of farm animals and playful things. Um, so downstairs you'll see that there's a, the video that Peter did that's also of the, the more um, uh, obvious war toys. You know, they're all darkened faces, they're all in sort of grimacing uh, poses, uh, but again, it's sort of like how you interpret these toys. Because most people would not think that this guy with the trombone is, you know, part of the military machine. Um, it's acrylic. Going on to the next question. Uh, oh, this is all acrylic. He used to work in oils. He used to work subtractively, um, where he would actually use sandpaper. This is not subtractive. This is all layers and layers and layers of glazes in acrylic. Um, it's not scumbling. <laughs> uh, it is dry brush right along there. Um, but that's all I get to say. <laughs> I asked him this morning, I said, what can I, what can I? <laughs> what secrets can you reveal? <laughs> can you tell us about the story? What is the narrative? Okay, so the narrative, um, again, because this is part of the series of the military thing, Peter also has done a lot. There are themes that keep coming up, even though the technique has changed in his life, whether it's printmaking or oil to acrylic or dream imagery. Um, one thing, he was raised in Long Island, and he has a love-hate relationship with the suburbs. <laughs> so a lot of times he will depict the suburbs where everything on the surface seems very copacetic, but there's an undercurrent. And I think a lot of people address that in, in their work. Um, but so this was sort of like, you know, it's sort of, if you take little sections of it and you only look at like this section, everything is copacetic in the suburbs. You got your little dogs, you got your garages, it means you have two cars. <laughs> um, but that there can be this sort of like horrific thing that's happening. Um, and I think that, you know, a couple of years ago we had a show that was in London and it was really with the most um, intense sort of um, commentary about military operations. And it's not that he's opposed to military, it's just that, you know, he wants people to question it and to not, again, also think that it only happens to others. You know, like again, with the toys, you're not identifying because they don't look like you, but war happens everywhere. And it's really only till 
when it comes to American soil that you sort of think of it in different terms. So he's sort of asking you to, you know, think about it, you know, whether it's tanks, um, you know, in the suburbs of Long Island or and in the news, you know, there that has happened in Boston, you know, after the marathon. Um, so it's sort of like it's still political. It's still um, questioning, trying to keep you to question. Yeah. Any speaking of questions? <laughs> I, got a, I got a question. Uh, yeah. Since uh, going back to the technique subject, um, the texture of the well, the texture of the old paintings where the, they they were like um, glass. Uh, yeah, and I was like, "What am I looking at?" Yeah. Was my first response when I when I saw when I saw them and. Now the um, the the texture reminds me a little bit of what the of um, yeah like the texture of a wall that's been sort of had paint rolled yeah. on with a with like a heavy mat. Yeah. Uh, so do, do you know? Can you give us some insight? Yes. Um, it is with a roller, and it is a uh, gloss gesso oh, okay. that he starts the start these in particular. Yeah. He does that before. Yeah, yeah. It's before, before, before really any paint is. And why a gloss gesso? What does that? That I don't know. Yeah, I don't know whether it has some sort of different property. I don't know. Yeah. But again, like Tony just mentioned, it is before um, paint is applied. And then you know he will sand back in, you know, to certain areas and then reapply. But he, when I asked him, okay, so. <laughs> Um, how to describe it, he said it's layers and layers and layers of glazes, but in acrylic, so. Well, the glazing, uh, it seems like glazing helps preserve that original texture, so that it, he doesn't lay it on so heavy. I've seen a few paintings, I think, yeah. like when it shows at Jack the Pelican several yeah. years ago, where um, it, there was some impasto, like yeah. paint strokes, mm -hmm. yeah, but, um, but that oh, yeah. seemed kind of, but, but the, this, this seems to, to really hold, to be very consistent all the way across. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the sense of the hand, the, I mean, there is a, you can see that there's a hand in the making of it, but, yeah. but like the old, his older style, well, that's, that's funny. sort of hidden. You should mention that because if anybody's seen his old, old, like the Dream series, it was something that people would say, oh my God, that's got to be uh, airbrushed. And it's like, no, it's not airbrush. I mean, that was the question he would always get. And on those, it was it was usually very dark, and then it was tiny little pieces of sandpaper that were just removing the color to move back to the white. That was the gesso underneath. Um, one thing I will add to it is that, again, you know, it's for Peter. It's not about making. Um, pictures that are pretty necessarily, but again about the questioning. So he recently completed a MTA, um, Massapequa Railroad Station project, and he used figures from the, uh, from a railroad series by a company, a British company called Dinkies. <laughs> and um, so in it, there's no military people, but what he wanted to do and what he was successful in doing is, again, he made them to be sort of ill at ease. He didn't make it like, you know, with pretty little seagulls or happy scenes. It was people that were waiting for their train. And, you know, some of the comments or concerns before the project started was, is this too depressing? Is this too much like real life? You know, people are not happy getting on a train going to work. <coughs> um, but, you know, if you, you look at some of those toys in a way, it's sort of, it is reflecting real life, you know? Um, so, people can look at that train station and say, oh my god, this is so great, look at these little toys. But there's a whole other backside to it, too. You know, there's, you know, just sort of like, you know, thinking about your life. What are you doing in those 30 minutes that you're waiting? You know, are you happy? Are you not happy? You know, so. I like the decision to hang the painting with the, the toys. I 
like the dialogue that it creates between real life plays, imagined yeah. world play, which is larger than life and um, yeah. you know scary. <laughs> yeah, I think I think it, that's a good point. You know, at, at first he did this for a show that he had in Chicago, where um, a lot of this series has either a painting and a video and then the toys. Mm -hmm. So there is a video that is called Parade that goes along with this. And that one does, the, that video has like, you know, the stretcher bearers and, and really <coughs> injured military figures in it. Um, but I think downstairs you get the idea, really what he's pushing is that, again, little kids from really early age are taught to really hate and to be violent with other with others. You know? And yes, there is the the you know cowboy series and the American Indians, but there's just something about toy manufacturers that they just keep perpetuating that. It's not it's not going away. And you would think that, you know, in this enlightened time the toy manufacturer are just following the heat though. They're just going with the money. I mean, they're not, they're not like, it's not a cabal. It's not the other they're not trying to create like child workers. Oh. It's just kids want to be, no. kids like play as combat. Uh, sure, exactly. But, you know, if you're looking historically, I mean, again, this is from toys from the 30s. Really, he's only dealing with toys from the 30s to probably the late 50s because, of, you know, they're from his father's collection. Um, you know, just, I mean, you'll see the toys in a typical way. I mean, and I'm sure, I mean, it, we do travel quite a bit, and so we're always trying to find, if we're in Turkey or if we're in China, we're trying to find depictions of American soldiers that are, that are made by them, you know, and how they depict Americans, and it's not that successful, you know. So are these toys that Peter actually played with as a kid, or were these on display as kind of Peter? No, yeah, these were, they were part of his father's collection. So his father didn't, there are a couple of pieces that his father had when his father was a child. Um, but then I think it became more for his dad, just sort of like collecting and acquiring. So, no, um, no, Peter, <laughs> funny story, short, is that Peter's father, they used to live half the year in New Hampshire and half the year in Florida. And he had not a massive collection of toy soldiers, but enough that when it came time for the children to sort of help open up the house or close the house, either in Florida or New Hampshire, the job came to us in New Hampshire of having to take each one of these little things down, wrap them in tissue, put them in a little box, hide them safely, and then the other brother in Florida had to do the same thing for their house down there. So it became sort of like, oh my God, you know, like hours of, you know, safeguarding these little things, which are not worth, it's not like the Forbes collection, you know, where you can have toy soldiers that are worth thousands of dollars. Um, but it was more just his emotional attachment to them. So it was sort of our love-hate thing with this thing with the with the toys and how many hours when, when the plane is leaving in like three hours and then get to whatever. But um, yeah, so he never played with them. I mean, it's also interesting that they're made out of lead and the significance of bullets are made out of lead and, you know. Lead poisoning. Also, yeah. yeah, there's a lot of correlations with the with all of the uh, violence in the 80s with like with uh, with lead poisoning. I think that, that long term lead poisoning can create like sure. insane erratic violent behavior. Yeah, yeah. I think you know most kids today are, are if they're playing with um, toys that are military toys, they're plastic. You know, I mean, yes, there are some that are are parts of series, and yes, there is the whole. Game of Thrones, sort of all that stuff that I don't, you know, have no connection really with of that sort of science fiction toys. Um, but you know, for Peter, this is just a much more personal um, history. So. James, do you think that Peter uses like the symbolism of toys also as like a safe attachment to talk about things that are more disturbing? Oh yeah, like, yeah. In a way, like, kind of presenting it in a safe kind of light, but you're able to. 
talk about like violence and adult themes, but through childlike imagery. Yeah, in a way. So yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, because obviously there's some nostalgia for Peter, obviously, but also yeah. I think there's some way of like kind of translating that into adult conversation. In a way, like I'm yeah. knowing Peter, you know yeah. what I mean? Like I'm kind of talking about some stuff. I know he's very political and, and like it pays attention to a lot of foreign affairs and things like that yeah. as well. But like to bring it home in a way that like people are able to look at it because at first it was fun. But sure. then you start getting down into the layers and you realize that this is actually a preface for something that's much deeper and much darker and yeah. things that are more adult. Like, like you said, like adult, you know, like violence and yeah. Things that are not so great to talk about and are not as comfortable as comfortable to talk about. Yeah, and I think you know, one aspect of his work, I think, and a lot of people's work is that you want the viewer to be drawn in, and however you are successful to do that, you know, whether it's bright colors or whether it's you know, uh, pop culture, anything that sort of draws you into it is a, is in my mind a good thing, and then if you stay there and if you then think about what really is happening, you know, and then it's successful. Yeah. So, um, um, and the video downstairs, you'll see, um, was also at a point where he was, because when he took the deanship at the academy, he was, you know, there was a certain point where he was trying to find other ways to still be able to create art, and so, he taught himself um, After Effects, Adobe After Effects, and you know he knows Photoshop enough to not like do a lot of Photoshop, but enough like I think a lot of artists do. Um, and so he taught himself After Effects, and he didn't take a class. And, you know he bought the books and did the CD things, but he learned really only what he needed to. So. He always describes the point where, you know, after he photographed the toys and he went and he did the video of the UN, because we live close to the UN, um, that when he was doing After Effects, that there's a puppet pen tool, so if anybody knows After Effects, and that it actually, so you take a photograph of this horse or the toy and apply the puppet pen tool to it and it will actually expand the legs and like the chest fills up with air. <laughs> and he felt like, wow, you know, this, this was like amazing. And so he said it, you know, it felt like something he could do in a very simple animation. You know, he's not an animator. Um, you know, something that just makes the paintings and the videos sort of alive and off the page. So, yeah. Anything? Any other questions, John? <laughs> 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 and we did, you know, you wish it could have been here, but, you know, but, so. And thank you guys for putting together the show. I mean, it really, you know, 17 artists or 18 artists is a lot of. <laughs> and about 70 pieces of work. We had to tone it down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a lot. We'll put, we'll put the ones on uh, the, the ones that make it on the wall online somewhere. So yeah. I'll, I'll make sure to see it. Yeah. Well, thank you, Thank you. Thank you.